I'm very grateful to the organizers for um, giving me a chance to share some of our work. And I really want to thank um, the other speakers for the fascinating talks, and I'm really looking forward to the whole program. Um, PDB, of course, has, been, has had such a huge role in the development of biomedical science. And of course, you've already heard about that. I'm very grateful to my colleagues, Helen and Stephen, for all the work they've done in this. It's been very inspirational. Uh, let's see here. Okay. So um, I wanted to mention the amazing role of Michael Rossman, who sadly passed away a couple years ago. He was also one of the founders of the uh, concept of the PDB and worked closely with Helen uh, and later Kathy Lawson to improve the whole methodology for uh, protein structure analysis, retrieval, um, having all, also created so many of the methods for solving protein structures. Um, I uh, had the great fortune of working with Michael as a postdoctoral researcher, and my first PDB entries were, actually it's not RH, yeah, it's uh, rhinovirus. Um, I was blanking for a minute if it was HRV instead of RHV, but um, this represents a structure that I had refined at three angstroms resolution, even using the um, uh, what what we thought of as observed phases from the non-crystallographic symmetry uh, reconstruction and um, uh, resolution. Um, uh, while I was working at Michael's lab, the HIV crisis emerged. Anyone who was infected with HIV basically had a death sentence. I was very motivated to take the training that I had from solving the structure of rhinovirus 14 and um, apply that to the um, AIDS problem. It, it appeared to me that um, if we had structures that could facilitate drug design, and I very fortunately met Stephen Hughes, a, a really outstanding retrovirologist and molecular biologist. And we began our work together 35 years ago. Uh, fortunately, he had uh, cloned HIV reverse transcriptase. I had always been fascinated by polymerases, how they would work. So this involved virology, structure, function, inhibition, drug resistance, and ultimately drug design. Um, problem with HIV, of course, un untreated infection usually leads to death. Um, it's a human retrovirus. One of the problems is that there are about one change in the 10 kilobase uh, RNA genome per, retro per replication cycle. And there are a very large number, tens of billions of virus particles in an infected individual. What this means is that it's a genetically moving target that's a problem for drug development because of drug resistance and also vaccine development. Uh, by now we know <clears throat> a fantastic amount about the molecular biology of HIV, the structural biology of HIV, and reverse transcriptase, integrase, and protease are the three major drug targets and fascinating, all three are dimeric. I don't have time to talk about um, a particular project in our lab, but we've solved the structure of the polyprotein precursor of the enzymes. And it turns out that reverse transcriptase and protease, even prior to proteolytic processing, have this shape and help each other dimerize. Very interesting insights into particle assembly and maturation. So RT is a central drug target. Um, greater than 90% of all therapeutic treatments of HIV infection involve RT inhibitors as drugs. And um, I'll tell you about how we were able to use crystallography to design two non-nucleoside RT inhib um, drugs leading to eventually six licensed medications. Um, this was the first structure we solved and reported in 1993, uh, PDB entry 2 HMI. And um, 
This was the first structure of any polymerase with nucleic acid bound in a relevant fashion for catalysis. And it, it's magnificent. There's a P66 subunit that has all of the catalytic activity, holds the nucleic acid, a P51 uh, subunit that surprisingly has the same amino acid sequence. So this is a heterodimer, but a different folded arrangement. And in the P66 subunit, you see that there's a fingers, palm, and thumb type of uh, motif that uh, resembles a human hand that's able to grasp the nucleic acid and also carry out catalysis. There's also a connection subdomain uh, connecting a second catalytic domain, RNase H. Um, uh, even by the end of the 1990s, we had a, um, a whole array of different kinds of structures of reverse transcriptase. Um, and uh, a number of groups had contributed to this, um, uh, including Tom Stites, Stephen Harrison, David Stewart, and David Stammers. And um, what we were able to see is that in going from the RT APO structure, the, the enzyme has to go under very significant conformational rearrangement, such that the thumb subdomain, which is in a, a fist-like conformation in the APO structure, uh, has to transform to more like a hitchhiking conformation to be able to grasp the nucleic acid and then to form the ternary complex. Um, there are further conformational changes where the finger subdomain closes down over the active site. And ba basically we can um, consider the conformational dynamics of the enzyme. We can look at the different snapshots and quite a few of these reactions have also been carried out in crystal O, including incorporations of um, uh, uh, nucleotides and um, uh, translocation binding of, of other many types of inhibitors. Um, in terms of the uh, drug targeting sites, what we see is that the nucleoside analogs, nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors bind to the polymerase active site. And these include AZT, which was the first drug approved for HIV treatment. Uh, also FTC and tenofovir, which are the most widely used anti-AIDS drugs, part of many different combinations. And right next to the polymerase active site, there's a hydrophobic pocket that binds non-nucleoside RT inhibitors. Nevirapine was the first of these, and the collaboration I'll tell you about led to the discovery of a travarine and ropivirine. Um, we've also spent a lot of time trying to understand the structural basis of drug resistance. Um, mutations that cause dr drug resistance, of course, can drug cause drugs to fail. And if you really want to win battles and eventually the war, you have to know your enemy. So we've looked at the specific uh, structural mechanisms that are involved. For example, in the non-nucleoside inhibitor case, there are uh, straightforward mechanisms such as um, tyrosine going to a cysteine, loss of aromatic stabilizing interactions, um, uh, steric hindrance from something going from a leucine to an iso isoleucine. Um, in the case of the nucleoside analog uh, resistance mutations, they're a bit more complicated, involving um, displacement sometimes of the template primer and also some pretty unusual mechanisms by which uh, 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 some of the nucleotides can actually be um, excised uh, in, in some cases by an incoming ATP pyrophosphate donor. Um, but I'd like to focus for uh, some minutes on non-nucleoside RT inhibitors known as NNRTIs. And um, these are nanomolar inhibitors. They're chemically diverse. They're allosteric inhibitors, meaning that they can have very low toxicity, very high specificity. Um, and there are six approved uh, for human use, including uh, atravirine and ropivirine. And 
Um, back in uh, 1989, 1990, we were working very hard trying to grow crystals of reverse transcriptase. We had begun that effort in 1987 when I arrived at Rutgers. Um, it was extremely difficult. Uh, we were trying to find any way to get uh, crystals to behave, diffract to about three angstrom's resolution. Um, we had both, uh, I, I began to uh, learn about Dr. Paul Jansen. He had uh, uh, decided to target HIV AIDS in 1986. He's the founder of Jansen Pharmaceutica. He had a library of about 70,000 compounds at the time. And then he began to search in antiviral assays with a small portion of his library, 600 representative compounds with clean biological uh, data. Um, our lab at about the same time in a parallel universe began crystallization. In 1990, while we were still failing to get good crystals, Dr. Paul published a paper in Nature describing the first non-nucleoside -nucle RT inhibitors. Well, we were pretty excited about that in our lab. And I wrote to Dr. Paul a short proposal saying that these compounds possibly can, could help our work in, in terms of obtaining crystals and uh, that in fact, our structures might be helpful to him. But here I was an unknown uh, assistant professor in New Jersey. What's the likelihood that a, you know one of the world's greatest drug developers uh, would respond? Well, in fact, I received a fax asking when was the earliest I could come over to where he was in Belgium to meet and discuss the project. That was very exciting. And you can see that the fax definitely dated um, that activity. Well, Dr. Paul um, was so fantastic at drug discovery. Uh, here he's um, honored on a Belgian uh, post postage stamp after he sadly passed away in 2003. Um, we began working together in 1990. Dr. Paul was really larger than life. Here he is shown at a table at our first meeting. Um, he uh, actually in his career discovered 80 drugs, which is really an unthinkable number. Most people who are famous for drug discovery have developed two, three, five possibly, um, but you know, how a paradol fentanyl, the first uh, successful anti, broadly successful synthetic in, antifungals such as ketoconazole, myconazole. Uh, these are just some of the amazing discoveries he made. He was a physician, a chemist, a pharmacologist. He was actually a Renaissance man. He spoke seven languages, uh, widely read historian. He had a unique style of management. He didn't tell people what to do. He asked questions and wise people uh, came back to him with possible answers. He didn't believe in rules. He thought that too much of it was slogans and he founded one of the world's most uh, successful pharmaceutical companies to this day. So anyway, uh, in our lab, we had gotten reasonable crystals around 1991, 1992, and by 1993, we had some pretty good structures. Um, we also started to obtain structures with his compounds, and um, uh, we uh, published um, a comparison of some of his structures with a, a, a structure from Tom Stites. What we saw was that in a pocket that accommodated many different kinds of chemical compounds, they all bound with a kind of butterfly-like motif. And that was very uh, interesting to chemists um, in a, a worldwide. Uh, one of the other things we learned from this is that in fact, this pocket that binds the NNRTIs is even actually closed in the absence of them. We knew at that time that even uh, to create that pocket, pocket, you'd need some sort of conformational breathing because the compounds are not going to just like burrow their way into uh, an interior. Um, there, there has to be sort of motion and dynamics that allow that. Um, but it also showed that you really noted, needed to have the structures with the bound inhibitor for any sensible design. Well, anyway, you have to have all good sense. Uh, you need to make compounds that are easy to take. 
Um, they can't have bad side effects for once a day treatment. And um, global utility uh, would mean efficient synthesis. So in a multidisciplinary effort, uh, Dr. Paul was making compounds. Um, they were being screened at a small company, a spinoff called Tebow Tech. We were determining crystal structures and the modeling was leading to better ideas for synthesis. Um, and of course, the best compounds would go for metabolic screen screening, animal models, uh, and eventually clinical trials. But the, the information from the crystal structures was driving the structural design of new compounds. So around uh, the time that we were um, contributing to, to the three-dimensional design, uh, there came a class of compounds that had very good properties against the resistant variants. This was actually the key problem at the time. Dr. Paul didn't wanna have compounds that only worked against wild type. He wanted it to work against very broad range of possible resistance, resistant variants. And it turns out that in the path that led from here to here, there were some key contributions in terms of, of structure-based design that led to three compounds that are still now in, in uh, these two are approved drugs. This one's actually being formulated as a, an antimicrobicide, uh, but I'll tell you, um, so a travering I've mentioned, this is the structure of the compound, um, very potent. It's time to begin wrapping up, Eddie, please. Uh, high selectivity index. And um, during this process from a variety of structures, we also learned that uh, very similar compounds could have different conformational shapes, especially ones with very potent, high, high potency against resistance variants. And so we suggested a model where wiggling and jiggling of compounds could actually uh, allow them to adapt to drug resistance mutations and be able to maintain activity. We also showed this through um, structural studies using uh, crystals that we had actually developed that diffracted one and a half angstrom's resolution, which is remarkable, re remarkable for this type of system. The best compound though was um, discovered in 2001, real piverine. It had sub nanomolar activity against all the key resistant variants. And in fact, um, it also had remarkable pharma pharmacological properties. But what I wanted to leave you with is that uh, real piverine has actually been um, uh, incorporated into five licensed medications in addition to intolins from a travarine. And uh, the situation improved so much from 1996 to 2006 that it used to be at times people would take 44 pills a day to keep HIV at bay. It became one pill a day in 2006. But in fact, in uh, January of 2021, the FDA approved the first long acting treatment, which is our compound Ropivirine plus an integration inhibitor. And this only has to be taken as injections one time per month. That makes compliance so much simpler. And this is a breakthrough. You even uh, see um, you even see this on TV by now. But the, the trend by now is to go to long acting once a month rather than once a day, rather than 44 pills a day. Just tremendous developments. And I'm very grateful to all my collaborators for this. And I'd also like to thank two of my uh, greatest mentors in life, Tom Blundell and Michael Rossman for their inspiration in this also.